Episode 1 of Midnight Mass begins with police and paramedics arriving at the scene of an accident. The driver responsible for this is Riley, who fell asleep at the wheel and finds himself put behind bars. Serving four years and forced to pay over $104,000 to the victim's family, Riley ends up seeing horrific visions of this girl while in prison. Four years pass and we jump over to Crockett Island where our tale properly begins. Riley's family includes mum Annie and Riley's younger brother, Warren. Out on his bike, Warren heads down to the docks with Ollie and Ocker, his two friends. They meet a guy called Bowl, yes, that is apparently his actual name, to score some drugs. Sporting a canoe that's been patched up, they row across to an island just off the mainland. This place is packed full of stray cats, with eerie yellow eyes dancing in the bushes. Only, these eyes don't seem to belong to a cat, especially when Warren shines the flashlight in that general direction and sees the outline of something. It's a brief glimmer, but enough to unnerve the kids. Speaking of unnerving, Riley finally arrives back home, where Annie shows to give him a warm welcome. As they walk through town back home, it's clear that everyone else is more than a little cautious around him. One of those includes Sheriff Hassan, who watches him suspiciously as he passes. Now, Hassan has a regular lockup and Joe, the resident drunk. It's certainly not his first rodeo, and it's clear Hassan is expecting Joe back sooner rather than later. Riley has missed a lot, and one of the more pressing concerns falls to Erin Green, the daughter of his old school teacher in town. Riley has a soft spot for her, but his heart sinks when he learns that she's pregnant. Back home, Riley decides not to attend church anymore. He's lost his faith in God and has decided to go his own path. His father loses patience though and lashes out, demanding that he show up at church no matter what, as a condition of his parole. Well, another condition of his parole and a constant haunting is that dead girl showing up at the foot of his bed. It's a regular Flanagan motif, seen in both Bly Manor and Hill House. It's still just as unnerving here too. The townsfolk gather together the next day as a new pastor arrives for the service, Paul Hill. He's filling in for the usual Monsignor, Pruitt, who's fallen ill while off on his trip to the mainland. Random residents step up to say hi to him after, with Paul immediately sensing that Riley isn't a complete believer. We can work with that, he says. However, Aaron shows up and the pair talk in private. Aaron has been in New York but also traveling all over America. As the pair walk together, the laugh and admit that they never return, but yet here they are, back on Crockett Island. Or, the crockpot as some residents have called it. Riley though admits he feels purposeless, stuck in the perpetual flow of time without knowing what to do next with his life. Aaron suggests he ride out the storm that due to hit the community and wait for what arrives tomorrow. As she apologizes to him for what's transpired, Aaron heads home. The storm batters the community and as Riley checks out the window, he notices a figure running up the beach. He believes it's Monsignor Prude and chases the figure up the beach. As lightning crackles overhead, the figure seems to vanish. Was it all just one big vision? When the clouds pass and the sun comes out, Riley and his family head down to the beach where they find seagulls swarming. All those stray cats from the island have washed up on shore with broken Episode 2 of Midnight Mass begins back on Crockett Island following the horrific cat massacre. Sheriff Hassan directs traffic, keeping the residents away from the beach for the time being. Hassan takes control of the situation, deciding they need to burn the deceased cats to avoid any sort of disease from spreading. Ed agrees, although there's undoubtedly an air of uneasiness surrounding this entire event. While Riley attends therapy, Father Paul conducts another sermon and does the rounds, trying to fill in Monsignor Pruitt's big shoes. As day turns to night, the ominous sound of flapping wings returns, matched by a dull thud as someone, or something, lands inside an abandoned building. This darkness is an interesting motif that's carried across to the next day's sermon, given it's Ash Wednesday. Paul is passionate, believing that Jesus will resurrect the island and bring bounty aplenty. Crockett Island has more than religious sermons though, as an Easter festival goes ahead, complete with music and stalls. In the wake of this, Paul sits with Riley and encourages him to ditch the AA meeting on the mainland and stay on the island. After all, he could set up his own chapter to help. 
Not only that, he reinforces that Prude isn't going to be showing up anytime soon. Things take a turn for the worst at the festival, though when Joe's dog, Pike, suddenly doubles over after being poisoned. Joe is absolutely convinced this is a deliberate act, and the toxicology confirms as much. When Hassan finds out, he confronts Bev. She was talking about rat poison earlier in the week, and her nonchalant attitude to Pike dying doesn't look good. Is she responsible? Meanwhile, Riley and Paul have their first session. Paul is convinced that alcohol isn't good or bad, pointing out that Jesus turned water to wine. As they discuss this, Riley opens up and admits that he killed that girl while drink driving. He points out the higher power that could be out there, refusing to do anything to help people in real need. He's brutally honest, going on to monologue about the absurdity of believing misery and sacrifice is a gift from God. Elsewhere, Aaron hears creaking around her house which is followed by an ominous dark figure lurking outside. She's not the only one seeing things though, as Sarah's mother, Mildred, sees something outside that apparently peeked right up at the window. In the morning, service goes ahead at the church. Father Paul finds himself constantly watching Lisa though, encouraging her to rise up from her chair and take the body of Christ. And just like that, she rises up and manages to step across the room to take it. A miracle? Or something much darker lurking in the shadows? Episode 3 of Midnight Mass returns to the church after the eventful service and seeing Paul in the confessional booth. He reveals that Monsignor Prude is sicker than they thought, and he's been lying about his health. Prude has been suffering from a nasty bout of dementia, and it's only deteriorating further as every day passes. Paul has been lying for the town's benefit, as Crockett Island witnesses a miracle. Given Sarah is a doctor, she wants to see Lisa on the mainland to do some tests and figure out how she was able to walk again. Her parents are determined to keep her where she is, unwilling to do more tests, I guess we're in the dark over what's happening then. With Lisa now able to walk, Father Paul hurries to his personal chambers, coughing up blood. There's no rest for the wicked though, as Riley and Paul have their next session. Much like Sarah, Riley is convinced that Lisa has healed herself. Although it's rare it can happen. However, Paul must have known this in order to encourage the girl to rise up. With neither giving much away, this conversation reaches a bit of a stalemate. The next day, Father Paul collapses mid-service. When he regains consciousness, Bev is there to oversee proceedings as Sarah examines him. He's dehydrated and clearly suffering from some sort of virus. As we soon learn, it's actually Joe's fault that Lisa stopped walking originally. He used his grandfather's gun to shoot Lisa by accident. This could well explain his drinking too, given he's consumed by guilt, but Lisa has been hating him all this time. However, standing in his caravan she forgives him for this sin. With miracles gripping the island, there's somewhat of a religious revival happening here. In fact, Bev manages to convince the different townsfolk to allow Bibles to continue being handed out at school. For Hassan, who's a Muslim, this makes him uncomfortable as he discusses the pursuit of knowledge and the deviations in religion. Unfortunately, Bev manages to win over the townsfolk during this argument. It also sways Ali too, who confronts his father later that evening and questions his own religion and beliefs. As Hassan shuts the lights off that evening, something seems to be lurking at the window. 52 minutes guys. 52 minutes it's taken for a horror series to deliver a scare. Good grief. At the church, the AA meeting between Riley and Paul has been expanded to allow Joe to get involved and join them. It's actually not until the walk home that he opens up to Riley. His sister passed away several weeks back on the mainland, but he's racked with guilt for not going back there to see her. Even in death she didn't want to return to Crockett Island. Meanwhile, Paul is not in a good way, and he doubles over, coughing uncontrollably. He doesn't have COVID though, and instead seems to be suffering from something far worse. As he stumbles over to Lisa's house, he suddenly collapses on the floor and dies before them, blood oozing out his mouth. As we cut back in time, we see Father Prude descending down into the caves where a winged beast arrives and bites at his neck. As it stands up, looking down at the priest, this creature slits its wrist and forces the priest to drink its blood. Anyway, after this long monologue, Paul suddenly awakens and draws breath in front of everyone. 
As the camera pans across the wall, an old newspaper clipping shows Father Paul. This seems to reinforce that Paul is actually a younger version of... Episode 4 of Midnight Mass begins with Sarah examining Aaron. When she does a scan, it seems like she's miscarried her baby as it's not in her uterus. After taking blood sample, Sarah is shocked to find the vial steaming and catching fire when reacting with the sunlight. Meanwhile, Bev fusses over Father Paul, getting him soup and cancelling mass to encourage his recovery. With the room bathed in darkness, Paul decides to confide in Bev, given she's a fellow believer. He admits that something is shifting inside him, and according to Paul, he can feel God. Could this be the demon angel thing we saw in the previous chapter? Well, given the sunlight seems to be burning him too, it definitely reinforces that concept. Out at sea, Riley joins Ed on the fishing boat. Thanks to his chats with Paul, Ed opens up and admits that he loves Riley, but it's difficult for him to show that. Following their outburst in the first episode, this is at least some progress with their estranged relationship. Back on the island, Aaron and Riley sit together and talk. The revelation that she's no longer pregnant has completely wrecked the girl, especially given her pregnancy saved her from a miserable and horrific ordeal on the mainland. Riley, meanwhile, talks to her about his dream. Aaron is a strange enigma, operating somewhere in that gray area between believer and atheist, and quizzing Riley about what happens when they die. Her middle ground allows her to see both sides of the argument, as Riley scientifically breaks down what he believes happens, including the release of DMT and the flood of memories and dreams. As Aaron speaks her version of heaven, she decides to go to the mainland to get a second opinion on what's happening to her. As day turns to night, Father Paul leaves his house and walks through the grounds, muttering passages from the Bible, as he does, he heads over to see Mildred, in order to continue their usual mass session. While this goes ahead without a hiccup, back home Paul doubles over and finds himself struggling. In fact, that evening he even drinks a whole vial of alcohol too. Mid-drink though, Joe heads over and admits Paul looks remarkably similar to how Prude used to during his younger years. Paul tries to talk to him about his alcoholism and managing to fight against his urges, encouraging Joe to come in for a hug. As he does, Paul refuses to let him go, eventually seeing Joe pull back, smash his head on a table and collapse, blood oozing from his skull. Paul doesn't call an ambulance, though and instead starts drinking this man's blood. In the morning, Mass looks set to go ahead, but there's a problem. With Joe dead and Father Paul sitting in the corner of the room, blood cakes his clothes and mouth, Bev shows up and decides to get him cleaned up, nonchalant to the entire murder scene. Really? Someone as religious as this is absolutely fine with murder? Anyway, as he shows what the sunlight does to him, Bev concocts a plan of her own. She leads Mass, encouraging Dolly to start singing and keeping the townsfolk busy, while Bev brings Wade into Paul's chambers. She wants him to dump the body out at sea, hiding the evidence completely. On the mainland, Aaron receives some devastating news. Apparently she was never pregnant to begin with, given the hormones in her body are all a normal levels. Aaron is confused and absolutely devastated, eventually heading back to the island, when the doctor gently encourages her to seek psychiatric help. Riley goes searching for answers with Father Paul, but is crushed when he finds out Joe isn't in the meeting. Given his sister has passed away, something he revealed to Riley the previous evening, Paul lies to him and claims Joe has gone back to the mainland to see her. This immediately rings alarm bells as Riley realizes he's lied. That evening, Paul is visited by the angel of God, who shows up to release his blood into the empty vial sitting atop the table. Riley, still reeling from Paul's lies, heads over to the community hall and sees this strange demon. As he does, it suddenly pounces on him, proceeding to suck. Episode 5 of Midnight Mass begins with Riley's family concerned that their son hasn't returned home for two nights now. Aaron too is concerned, checking her phone and texting him. Of course, all of this is in vain. Meanwhile, Mildred seems to be de-aging, given she's lighter on her feet, and has picked out a new outfit for herself too. Sarah is understandably shocked and tries to explain this. With mass cancelled, the townsfolk are just as shocked when they notice Millie up and about again. 
with Joe missing, Hassan begins to do the rounds, trying to find out what's happened to him. Aaron only compounds his worries further, admitting that Riley has gone missing too. Aaron admits that they were talking about death several days prior, something that's made worse by Aaron's miscarriage. This is obviously a line of questioning designed to try and see if Riley was suicidal or not. Right now given Riley appears to be dead this much seems to ring true. The congregation goes ahead that night, with Father Paul standing up and discussing God's army and the meaning of Good Friday. He promises that they're going to do good things, as Mass ends and Millie walks away. She's shocked by the words being spoken and demands Sarah not go back. That's not my church. That's not the man I knew. She says, horrified. Meanwhile, Riley returns absolutely fine to Aaron's house that evening. He wants to go for a boat ride, encouraging her to join him. As the moon shines down, glistening like diamonds on the water, Riley discusses what happened to him. We then cut back in time to the moments just after the demon seemed to slaughter him. Paul inexplicably manages to unsnap Riley's neck, bringing the man back to life. He admits that death doesn't have to be part of him anymore, encouraging Riley to take a seat. Now, it seems like he's suffering from the same affliction as Paul. Paul and Riley sit together, with the former revealing just what's happening. He unveils that he's actually Pruitt, only younger, and asks for forgiveness regarding the lie he told about Joe's sister. Paul continues on, claiming that Joe Colley has gone home. Riley realizes he's been killed but is taken aback when he learns the creature in the room was actually an angel. Riley was apparently brought back for a reason, and Paul urges him to seek courage and embrace why he's there. Bev has fully embraced this too, working with Paul to do God's will. As Paul continues to spill his words, he tries to convince Riley that what's happening is a blessing, and he should embrace it. As Riley heads home, catching us up to the moments at Aaron's house, Bev worries that he's not a reliable vessel. Now, Riley has taken Aaron out into the middle of the water, so he has nowhere else to go. Riley wants to go to the mainland and admits he's loved Aaron his whole life. As the sun rises, he sees the girl he killed as she used to be and holds her hand. Only, all of this is a vision as Riley burns and fades from this world. Episode 6 of Midnight Mass begins on the boat, as Riley's remains float across the wood. Aaron moves the ash with her bare hands and rows back to the island. As she does, his family awaken, unbeknownst to them that Riley has passed. Still, Aaron stumbles over to Sarah's place and reveals her crazy story about Riley. Although it is physically impossible, Sarah believes her. Given the blood vials, she too confirms her story by moving a Petri dish to the sunlight and showing it go up in flames. This singular act is then met with more surprise when Mildred shows, younger than ever before. Meanwhile, Paul finds himself disappointed by Riley spitting out his gift. Bev stirs things up, highlighting the story of the apostles and how they poison the faithful. Midway through talking though, Ed shows up with Riley's letter. He's worried about his son, but Paul convinces him that he's gone to the mainland and left. When Ed skips away, Paul reads the letter and simply screws it up. Aaron knows the truth about what happened though, and encourages Annie to join her that night. Only, given it's the night of the Easter vigil, they have no plans to leave the island. With no other choice, she spills the truth about Riley's death, but Annie refuses to listen. Later that day, Sarah, Mildred and Aaron all head down to the shore, intending to go to the mainland to get those blood samples tested. With no ferry and all the boats docked, the trio leave empty-handed. However, they are reminded of the Easter vigil that evening. In the Hassan household, Ali convinces his father to join him at the vigil too. As night descends, all the different residents begin walking up the streets and singing hymns. Eventually the entire community gather in the church for Easter service. Paul immediately reveals the truth while there, unveiling that Monsignor Prude is actually himself. As the service continues, in front of everyone Sturge collapses and begins convulsing. He eventually passes, but this seems to be a ploy to bring the body back. And just like that, the angel waltzes in through the front door for the entire congregation to see. Brandishing its wings before them all, Paul speaks on behalf of it as Sturge is brought back to life. And just like that, all the believers brandish a glass full of liquid. This certainly isn't orange juice though, it's poison. 
Paul encourages them all to have faith and believes they should drink. Hassan has seen enough and brandishes his gun, pointing it at the angel. Unfortunately he's tackled to the ground before he can fire. Defenseless, he's forced to watch Ali choose God, while everyone else does the same and drinks their suicidal cocktail, doubling over and dying. Mildred has seen enough and grabs Hassan's gun, shooting Paul in the head. Bev is convinced that he'll be okay though, while the angel snatches up Mildred and tackles her to the ground outside. Those men and women who took the juice are brought back as apostles, complete with glittery yellow eyes. Everyone else is far from safe though, as they immediately pounce on the others. A massacre ensues and it's pure chaos. Everyone scrambles to break out, leaving a rebel group to squeeze into the back passages. There, Aaron shoots Bev in the chest despite her confirming that she'll revive in less than five minutes. As the small band of sane survivors take off, Bev returns to life and opens the doors, organizing her apostles to take the town by storm and leaving fire in their wake. The episode review. Midnight Mass returns with another slow episode, one that completely abandons any sort of horror or mystery and instead embraces the ridiculous. Now, don't get me wrong the angel certainly looks creepy, but Midnight Mass showed its hand too soon and paid the price. This is why The Thing and Alien work so well and still hold up to this day. The creepy atmospheric horror those works of art managed to conjure are unrivaled by comparison to today's wave of horror. I say horror, Midnight Mass is basically a religious drama at best. Compared to say The Third Day or 30 Coins, this show doesn't hold a candle to either of those. There's absolutely no scares here, and save for a few creepy moments early on, does little to actually make this long slog worth the journey. With Riley dead and the show struggling to find a focal figure to take his place, the entire chapter takes far too long to get to the good stuff, and when it does, fails to turn that into something.